I'm Flora Salim. I'm a Cisco Chair in Digital Transport at the School of Computer Science and Engineering at UNSW Sydney. And today I'd like to talk about learning more with less. So there's so much data out there. And that's really very much why um, AI has been fueled by data. And, um, and even recently with the Industry 5.0, there's a proliferation of IoT in many domains which means uh, it's, it's not just the typical big data, big data from the, uh, you know, the unstructured text and all that, but there's so much sensors uh, coming from, um, you know, our environment from the cities, even from, from, from your wrist, from your pocket with your smartphones and all that. So, this, and you think, okay, great. Now we've got so much data. That means there's a lot more um, uh, opportunity for, um, for AI to be more powerful. And there's so much more opportunity for us to learn human behaviors with all these sensor data in the wild. And I talked about this sensor data in the wild because they actually that initially deployed for certain purpose. Maybe it's about monitoring uh, your, your steps. It might be monitoring traffic, but it, apparently when you start combining them all, you can start to learn a lot of other unprecedented things that you never thought about. Uh, but is it really true? Um, you know, has AI been really, really powerful these days? Uh, has it gone beyond just doing narrow tasks, but really uh, the uh, artificial general intelligence is it really here and now. Well, uh, the thing is, uh, uh, I think we all know that typical machine learning algorithms require a high volume of data. And, and the thing is, uh, this high volume of data, uh, actually, it's not just you need a huge amount of data, but uh, you actually need lots of training data, uh, especially if you're thinking about the paradigm of supervised learning. Um, so what does it mean? Uh, you need a lot of training data to make things work. And I understand why, um, you know, uh, our previous speakers said, you know, we're moving, we're trying to move away from machine learning because uh, there might be a lot of pros and cons with it. But I'll, I'll try to uh, debunk some of these uh, with this uh, talk as well, trying to actually help uh, how we how we can actually make um, machine learning model to work with less training data, but at the same time, uh, more explainable. So of course, people think, oh yeah, we have lots of data now, but you know, oh, oh we have this code now, let's let's work. With but actually we have we need a lot of training data and training data means we need lots of label data and thinking again back to the um, environment where we have lots of sensor data um, and we think oh we can start learning about people's behavior and um, conditions uh, well in fact we actually if we want to use the uh, off-the-shelf um, supervised learning mod algorithms to train a model uh, we need those data to be annotated uh, it's not as simple as annotating images. So you, you know that the, the boom of uh, deep learning came out of the ImageNet uh, because the ImageNet um, was available. Uh, thousands of data, the, uh, images data, well labeled. It's easy for you to say, oh, I know that's a dog, that's a picture of a cat. But if you see, um, you know, hundreds of sensor data like this in the city, how do you label them? How do you know this is a, of a certain behavior? So annotating this big sense of data is invisible, challenging, time consuming, and actually it's expensive. And, and the thing is, uh, sense of data, they are not, um, they're very noisy. They're not easily annotated. Uh, let me just quickly um, show you one thing. Uh, I was actually expecting the uh, reactions enabled, but otherwise, let's go with it. Um, I can't see uh, comments, but... Um, uh, think about, look at these two um, uh, ECG sensor sample representation uh, in a row. Uh, so this is again just one dimensional uh, and one of them actually is normal and another one is uh, 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 basically heartbeat of someone with cardiac arrhythmia. Now, uh, quickly, I just want to see um, uh, where, whether you can differentiate which one is uh, the one with uh, uh, cardiac arrhythmia and which one is normal. Maybe tell me which one is normal. Um, let's see if I can, let me see if I can see the chat. No, nobody can chat, okay. All right, that's fine. I can tell you uh, which one is normal. Uh, this is a bit harder to differentiate unless you're a medical doctor. You, if you have a domain expertise, you'll be able to tell that the first one is the abnormal one, not the second one. 
But uh, what you do normally then with a machine learning, uh, traditional machine learning, statistical machine learning, you use feature engineering. Say for example, uh, this uh, one is labeled as, uh, the top one's labeled as someone with cardiac arrhythmia and the second one is the one with normal. Then you try different kind of features uh, and then see which one is most representative. So um, for example, here, if you use a uh, wave transformation, then you can see clearly that maybe this is the most important feature. And you can see this is actually showing a normal um, uh, signals there. Uh, there's on a wavelet, uh, once the spring transfer, whereas the one on the top is slightly uh, different. Now, uh, in here, you could see that it requires handcrafted feature engineering, even just for one single task and one um, sig signal. Now, there's a lot of wide variety of inference tasks. These are just uh, to name a few. Some of the models that we've trained using uh, sensor data in the wild. Um, and, you know, all of these have been, uh, I don't know if you can still see. Okay, sorry. So, um, so the question is how to then develop machine learning models with less? Uh, how do we work with um, minimal to no label data? And how do we work with uh, less samples or even small amount of data to work with? So that means um, this is the low data regime. Um, and uh, finally, also how do we work with less resources? Because uh, uh, deep learning becoming more and more resource hungry. And of, of course, that's not good for and not sustainable for in our environment. Um, and people love representation learning because it's um, uh, it's very powerful, uh, and a lot of times actually a lot more um, you know a, a lot more optimal than statistical uh, machine learning models. So how do we work with minimal to no training data? Um, so uh, in our in our approaches, we want to do self supervised learning. Just wondering if I get it right. I wonder if you okay. Now, what is the characteristic of a good sensor representation? Um, so this comes from our paper. Um, first is compact, uh, second is representative, uh, then robust and reusable. Uh, the definitions are in our paper. Um, um, so in order for us to be able to achieve a representation that is representative, so no matter how big it is, um, how big the time series or how small it is, it needs to remain compact and representative and robust to noise and reusable for downstream tasks. Now, um, in order for this uh, general, generalizable representation learning to be achieved, we need data efficient learning techniques. And this is, comes where, uh, this, this is where self-supervised learning paradigm comes in. Now, uh, we just released a new um, a review paper and uh, on a preprint, you can take a look. Uh, but this, this snapshot came, uh, comes out of that um, uh, preprint. So this is the comparison between supervised model and self-supervised model. With a um, self-supervised model, we actually don't need label because the thing is it learns the supervisory signals from the data itself. So it either learns from its own structure or pattern or distribution by learning uh, a pretext uh, uh, task, sorry, this is a, a typo there. Um, so it's actually generating a pseudo label to learn, uh, to learn from uh, based on uh, the distribution and the pattern in the data. So uh, one example of the loss function is uh, contrastive loss. And in here, for example, uh, if you, can, you have lots of images, no label uh, whatsoever, whether that's a plane, whether that's a bird or a giraffe or a cat, but with contrastive learning, it will learn uh, with, for example, different augmentations that, you know, these image, images of the bird, they belong together, whether images of the plane, they belong together. So some people think it's, a, it's actually clustering, but it's not really clustering because it's actually learning supervisory signal from the data itself. Um, now, uh, this uh, contrastive learning came out of um, uh, computer vision, but how do we then um, apply this in uh, time series? So, um, in our paper in 2020 called Espresso, uh, we we learn all kind of different um, um, sensor data uh, uh, and behavior changes in the sensor data that actually signify uh, either boundaries of classes, uh, whether, for example, this could be somebody uh, 
uh, walking to somebody running, for example, uh, or so this one here, and this one is potentially a certain heartbeat. Um, so that, that can be based on the different um, shape changes or can be based on the statistical patterns. And that could be combination of those as well. Now, the thing is, how do we actually uh, learn this uh, pattern in the uh, contrastive manner? So we were the first um, back in um, uh, when we submitted a paper in late 2020. I think we were the first, one of the first who did, uh, you know, uh, self-supervised learning on time series, and uh, we we propose a new uh, contrastive loss function, uh, uh, contrastive loss and reconstruction loss function for. Um, uh, for time series. So what we did was basically uh, ensuring that how do we embed this representation of time series that uh, if, if the positive pairs are learned and there's a future pairs learned together, uh, the, uh, the history in the future, uh, uh, if we can use the history to learn the, uh, the future, uh, to predict the future well, we know that there's no change point in, in that segment. Otherwise, th there is a change point. That's the part where we actually use to detect change point or anomaly. Now, uh, let's say, uh, so this is what we did. If you want to learn more about the, the work and the code is also available, uh, feel, feel free to visit our website. Now, there's a lot of also um, uh, issues with um, not enough data. If we don't have enough data to learn from, how do we even uh, train a model? So there are a couple of tricks. Uh, so either we leverage augmentation or we use pre-training or we leverage domain adaptation. So again, uh, taking um, uh, this e figure from our recent uh, review paper on self-supervised representation learning on multimodal and temporal data. Um, so this is the typical paradigm of self-supervised training. So um, we do a pre-training um, and without any label. Uh, and because it's come up with this different uh, mapping of the, uh, 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 the it actually come up with a pre-trained model. And then we can use it for any downstream uh, tasks, uh, such as either anomaly detection or classification with uh, uh, another uh, downstream model. Now, uh, just giving you an example of what we did um, uh, with the pre-training uh, paradigm. So this was a, uh, a work we did where we we use unlabeled uh, audio data uh, recorded with um, smartphones. So uh, any any respiratory or uh, cough sounds, which was collected in 2020. So back then, as you know, the pandemic has just started. Um, and people were having a lot of symptoms and they were not sure whether, you know, uh, whether the cough that I'm having or the, the respiratory sounds uh, that I'm having actually are related to COVID or not. And there were some re uh, initiatives, including uh, from Cambridge, uh, Cambridge uh, COVID-19 sounds and uh, our PI in our um, discovery project, uh, Chile Mascolo also released this app called COVID-19 sounds. Uh, IS uh, Bangalore also released another app called Coswara. So a lot of initiatives, MIT also have their own app, but Although lots of uh, these recordings were um, uh, uh, collected, not many actually came back, went back to the app and said, yes, I had COVID after I got tested or no, I didn't have COVID. So, but there were lots of recording without any labels. So uh, we actually then use this uh, contrastive pre-training um, uh, paradigm to train an unlabeled respiratory sound uh, as a pre-training phase, and then we uh, use a downstream task to, uh, that has the label data and pre uh, to predict whether someone has COVID or not. And this was the first work that used self-supervised learning. So without any label to train a model to predict whether someone has COVID-19, only based on the audio sounds. Uh, this was published in KDD 2021. Um, and, and if you, uh, I, I don't have time to go through the details, uh, but we did a couple of tricks as well with uh, the masking uh, mechanism, so we can then fine tune the downstream classification uh, with the audio as well. Um, and uh, we actually train them, uh, pre did the pre-training on unlabeled data from IS Coswara dataset from Bangalore, which was collected again largely from around the world, but largely from India. But then. Uh, tested on data sets collected by Cambridge, which was also global, actually a a have a lot more global population. And we found that even with these, uh, you know, maybe people ask, okay, was there any bias? But we quickly found that there's, uh, uh, the pre-training mechanism worked really well uh, to be able to differentiate uh, these uh, COVID-19 uh, related features. Um, and how do we work with less resources? Now, um, uh, Think about, uh, you know, uh, typical machine learning model again, 
uh, you normally have to uh, work with the paradigm. Let me collect all the data and let me clean them all. Let me store them in a data lake or big, big central server that only I can work with them. But how do we move away from it? How do we move away? And how do we use actually, for example, with IoT and sensor data in the wild? Can we actually learn them on the edge? So how do we use federated and on edge? Um, learning uh, in self-supervised paradigm. So we did that um, uh, in this pap uh, paper that we uh, had published as well in 2020, where um, the training uh, uh, with self-supervision could be done on on device um, of uh, you know uh, of different sets of data on the device, and then the model can share the model weight with the model actually in the central server. So no data being transferred to the central server only only what's being learned. So, um, so the private data can stay within the device. So this is actually a good way of thinking of privacy preserving uh, machine learning as well. So uh, only model weights being shared. Now, um, uh, just giving you a, a very brief idea about that, for example, is um, uh, again, with, with contrastive loss, we perform an augmentation of raw, raw signal, for example, if it's an EEG, we came up with a wavelength transformation to do a scalar, scalar gram contrastive network. And then we, we see whether this is actually the, um, uh, the same uh, coming from the same data or not. And we use, uh, we compute a contrastive loss. And based on that, uh, we see whether we actually come up with the, uh, uh, the pseudo labels. Uh, and we use different kinds of data sets. So from sleep stage recognition, to activity recognition, to sensing the position of people uh, using Wi-Fi signals and distraction, detection of stress uh, from wearables. Uh, and again, uh, these, these are uh, the results that come out of, this, uh, of the uh, downstream task classification, whether it's actually uh, active recognition or slip recognition. Um, uh, and you can see that uh, those that are actually uh, predicted to be of the same class actually are uh, uh, a class sort of closer together um, with the SNA embedding visualization. And we can, we can actually show that uh, this works really well. What's even interesting is, what about if we don't have enough training data? Well, let's say if we reduce the number of instances per class that we use, um, and if, if it's using fully supervised learning, the performance is always much lower than self-supervised. So uh, actually, um, we, we show that also uh, using self-supervised paradigm, uh, it also helps with a uh, low data regime. Um, I don't have much time left, but let me just quickly show you that uh, we can also work with very little samples. So unseen scenarios when you, for example, uh, this is a, uh, a smart city project we did in, um, in Mornington Peninsula Shire in Victoria, when we only have a few data, days of data to predict parking availability. Uh, and, you know, how do we even train a model if we only have a few days of data? Uh, we've had experience of training mod prediction models with data from Melbourne CBD that has more than four, five years of data. So uh, because of that, then what we did was, you know, um, how do we do, for example, domain adaptation with adversarial learning? So uh, that's what we did in this, um, uh, in this work. Um, let me just quit, skip this because we don't have time. Um, So uh, the last thing I'd like to talk about is the explainability of representation learning models. How do we, uh, I mean, we all love representation learning models because uh, as I showed you before, um, you know, it's very powerful, but how do we um, actually make them explainable? So um, uh, representation learning is a black box. We, we, we all know that. Uh, and we have little control in the latent representations because it's, we don't do feature engineering as what I showed you before. Uh, we we uh, you know we basically uh, define the, uh, the the algorithm the the loss function maybe we did some kind of gradient descent and then you got the later representation and you got the result now um, uh, but we don't really have a control over the features now and it's very hard then to explain the output of it um, uh, and in, in comparison to for example uh, inherently interpretable models such as statistical machine learning like a decision tree for example so. Uh, how do we actually then use still representation learning um, 
uh, but make them explainable. So, so this is the widely accepted assumption, right? So uh, optimality and explainability. So the more powerful the model is, the less explainable it is. This is the wide, widely accepted assumption. But can we refute this on a deep learning model, especially for uh, time series spatial temporal data from the city? Um, so this is the bit that we need to understand. How does the deep learning module work? Um, and this is where the decentral representation learning work. This is what, how we actually want to uh, find out how uh, an image could come up into this kind of image again when they are learned. So um, uh, we then perform this decentral representation learning on spatial temporal uh, data. Let me just skip the details because we don't have time. But uh, again, the paper is published in Siam Data Mining this year. Um, and this was uh, tested on different data sets from pedestrian data sets to vehicle data set to bike NYC data set. Uh, and what we actually found that there's a clear negative correlation between um, performance and disentanglement. And we also found that actually, uh, yes, uh, disentangled representation can help downstream tasks, uh, even in few short learning. So even if we don't have uh, enough training data, uh, our performance is a lot better uh, uh, then model that, that they are not disentangled because we can control and we can understand the latent features that actually contribute to the performance. Uh, so at the end of the day, uh, this can lead to a more sustainable uh, training. So try our codes, try our data sets. A lot of them are public. Uh, we also just released new data set in nature scientific data, one of the largest multidimensional behavior sensing data in the world with multimodal sensors. Some of the open challenges on future work, uh, continual learning for multimodal sensor data in the world because behaviors keep changing um, and more work on explainability uh, on representation learning. And even how do we actually ensure that the model are fair? So um, uh, I wanna thank you. I wanna thank all my uh, students and postdocs. Uh, some of the, uh, the work that I share are truly theirs uh, and also my collaborators. Thank you. And also UNSW AI, AI thank you.